for some time now, health officials have said that the coronavirus is spread through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes. But there has been scientific evidence that suggests that the virus can hang in the air for hours as aerosols. Joining us now to discuss this topic, El Segundo Fire Department Medical Director, Dr. Mark Cohen, who is also acting as a consultant to the city in regards to the COVID-19 crisis. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for having me. Dr. Cohen, can you tell us how aerosols are different from droplets? In general, aerosols are liquid or solid particles that are suspended in the air. They can be visible like fog, but are most often invisible like dust or pollen. Droplets are generally considered to be larger liquid collections that don't float in the air and will fall to the ground within six feet or so. When you exhale, sneeze, or cough, you release a cloud of gas and liquid droplets, and some of those droplets are relatively big. Those big droplets are heavy and will fall to the ground before they evaporate, but others are small and can linger in the air, drifting on air currents for minutes and possibly even hours. Now, if a droplet is small enough, the moisture in it could evaporate before it has the chance to reach the ground. And if there's something that's suspended in that small little droplet, like a, a viral particle or a bacteria, then it's possible that that virus or bacterium could be left suspended in the air, light enough to float on air currents like dust would. So these particles are considered aerosols. And the big question when it comes to COVID is whether or not infectious virus can survive and be transmitted through aerosols or suspended particles. Can the coronavirus be spread by airborne transmission? In other words, can it be transmitted through these aerosols? Well, it hasn't really been proven as a definitive route of spread in the community, but we have seen cases of likely transmission in the hospital setting at the beginning of the pandemic. But most of those cases were in association with what are considered aerosol generating procedures. So if this can happen in the hospital and it's now been recreated in the lab setting as well, then there may be certain instances where it could happen in the community but it's still not considered to be a very likely cause in terms of transmission, but it is now a potential cause and one that can't be completely ignored. So where can a person be more at risk to potentially be infected by aerosols? So a person's gonna be more at risk to be infected by aerosols in a place that there's not as much air exchange. So if there is going to be any kind of viral particle that's in the air, that's floating in the air, the longer that you're sitting in that environment, breathing that same air, the more at risk you're going to be. So that's going to be more indoor areas, areas with poor ventilation or areas where there's going to be a lot of people communal in one area without air moving through and without any type of filtration. Well, how can we protect ourselves, especially if we are indoors? We know that some people are even back to work in offices. So being back in work and back in the office, again, you want to make sure that you maintain certain basic rules. And again, that comes back to the universal masking and social distancing. But now that we're also talking about aerosolization, we also want to talk about ventilation. So just to touch base on the universal masking, that means, again, you are wearing a mask and everybody around you is wearing a mask. That ensures that any kind of droplets that you might be exhaling are being caught in the mask before you can put those out into the, the environment and possibly have those land on somebody else and infect somebody else. That also provides protection as the people around you can't exhale droplets because those will be filtered by the mask and will protect you from potential infection. Social distancing, again, a very basic thing where the more space you have between yourself and somebody else, the less likely it is to catch anything or to, to basically contract any kind of infectious disease from somebody else. But when it comes to COVID and aerosolization, we're now also talking about increasing ventilation. We want to make sure that we have as much air moving through a closed space, especially now that we're back in an office situation where we could be working alongside other people or in a group situation. So you want to make sure that the, there's as much air moving through from open windows, from being in an outdoor environment, uh, from having uh, filtration such as a HEPA filter, and just making sure that there's good air exchange so that if there is any kind of droplet or particle, or in this case, an aerosol that's actually in the environment and the atmosphere around you, that's being washed out as the air is exchanged rapidly. Doctor, we know that cloth face coverings don't necessarily keep the aerosols out. So some people are saying, why even wear them? So the face coverings don't necessarily keep aerosols out, but they do keep droplets out. So it's worth wearing them because the primary mode of transmission is still considered to be droplet transmission. And while there is a theoretical risk of aerosolization and transmission through aerosols, 
If the primary mode is droplet transmission and the face masks are effective against that, and they truly are, then there is significant and clear benefit to wearing a mask, both benefit to you as well as to the people around you. Well, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for talking to us today about the coronavirus, aerosols, and more importantly, how to protect ourselves. Michelle, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks again, doctor. And don't forget to check out elsegundo.org for all the latest and accurate information on COVID-19.